It is difficult to describe the it factor, or what it means to be a winner. If there's a guy I can definitively say has those characteristics, it's Frankie Ferrari. Frankie was a two-time WCC first team selection and is currently playing in one of the top professional leagues in the world. On this podcast, we discuss his unique journey and his ability to tap into his peak performance. Frankie shares some awesome stories in this one, and I hope you guys enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Flow Station Podcast. Today we have an absolute legend joining us, Frankie Ferrari. Thank you for joining me, bro. Of course, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, I met Frankie in high school at Eastern Washington League Camp. We've been friends ever since. Got to play a few tournaments with him, and, uh, you know, it's great to have him on. So, Frankie, give me a little bit about your backstory, bro, um, from your origin story in Hoop. saw a little article where you said your goal was to be a pro basketball player since the third grade. What really started that vision and, and what it took to get you there? Yeah, as you know, um, I come from a basketball family. Uh, my dad being a high school coach, and I grew up in the gym. He, uh, he coached at Berlin High School where I where I went for 20 years. He coached a junior varsity team, so I was at his practice, you know, every day from the day I can remember. Um, and we always had a hoop. We have a half court in our backyard here, so basketball was something that I was really passionate about from from birth, really, and, and kind of took it and ran with it growing up. But I, I played a lot more sports than just basketball. I played baseball, football soccer tennis boxing so i did it all um and then as i grew later into high school um i figured you know this is what i really love to do uh, it was kind of based down to baseball and basketball and i really didn't enjoy practicing baseball so you got to do something that you love and I, I wanted to become a professional and, and, and day in and day out just baseball wouldn't work for me so i took basketball and i ran with it and it's uh, it's going well so far um a little bit of background i grew up in Burlington, california suburb of san francisco um, not not too known for their, you know, athletes like, you know, Seattle or LA or whatever. Um, but, but we've had our fair share. Um, and just a normal kid that, you know, really just loves sports and loved to compete and uh, grew up with three brothers, always competing at whatever we did at a young age. And I think that the competitive gene really has transitioned and, and, and transformed me into the, in the person and the player I am today. So, so you talked about just having that vision and, and always a competitive nature growing up. You know, we both grew up in a generation that was a little bit different with social media, a lot of external pressures and external distractions that a lot of the, the older generations didn't have to go through. How have you been able to separate yourself from that and, and still continue to grow and, and enjoy the game of basketball? Yeah, it's funny. Like, growing up, um, you know, you'd watch YouTube and, and stuff, and, you know, we really didn't have, or I didn't have, you know, Twitter or Instagram until high school. Um, so in that sense, it, it didn't affect me too much. But YouTube was really beneficial and stuff like that growing up, looking at highlights and stuff, and then looking at my own personal journey. Um, as a lot of people know, I had a lot of, like, YouTube videos in high school in terms of, like, mixtapes and all that stuff. Nothing that I asked for or signed up for. It kind of just happened. Uh, you know, guys started filming your games and you play well and they keep filming them. Not necessarily did that give me pressure as some people look at it. I think it was good exposure and, you know, coaches knew who I, who I was or, you know, people knew my name in the basketball world, not just because of the name, but then they could put it to a face um, through the YouTube videos and stuff. So I think social media in, in, in that sense has, has helped me and benefited. Um, it just honestly, you know, it depends on who you are and how you deal with it. I'm not one to, you know, try to put my whole life out there on Instagram or Twitter, but it is unique to see, you know, what other people are doing and, and you also can interact with certain fans and, and, and also younger kids that, you know, you want to give advice to and, and help share. So um, it, it's been unique. I think social media in this day and age, it's hard for older people or people that didn't grow up with this athletics wise to relate. But uh, I think if you take it in a good stance, then uh, it can be beneficial. Yeah, for sure. I, I got to stay a week in your house and take just take us through. There was an underground weight room, you know, a little boxing area outside. You had the shooting gun. Just take me through what, what that was like growing up in that dynamic with your brothers and uh, how it helped you become a better player. Yeah. So the Ferrari compound, as some will call it, <laughs> It's always full. It was never an empty house. We had neighbors, brothers, cousins, you know, everyone really in the neighborhood that was somewhat athletic or, and it didn't matter what sport you played. Uh, they were over at our house. We had the weight room downstairs and we had a little boxing area. We used to have an actual ring in the garage. And then we have a little theater room as well as the, as the half court in the back with the gun. So uh, my parents, you know, wanted us to be, you know, in athletics, not just say, Hey, you know, I'm going to force my kids to be athletes, but just, in a sense to, to keep you out of trouble and keep you focused and always, you know, 
use athletics to teach discipline and hard work and things like that. So I'm always c- competitive as you stayed with us for the week and, and found out really quick. Um, but no, it, it was great. You know, we had a, a very good support system and, and it helped us develop relationships with, you know, friends I still have to this day. And, uh, you know, I, th- I got to think of a good story, but I mean, I mean we've had wars <laughs> in the backyard turned into fights playing basketball after you were probably involved in the short week you were here. Um, but no, it was fun. It was fun. Uh, growing up, uh, my dad and, and mom are two competitive people in, in the work world, um, and, it, and it transitioned to athletics. And they always wanted us to be home and, and under their watchful eye and be able to compete and have fun and, and kind of do what we love. So yeah, they set us up pretty well. Yeah, man. I, I think a big aspect of flow and being in your peak performance is challenge and, and having those always present and to, to grow and and to evolve as a, as a player, as an athlete. What were some of the, the biggest challenges you had? Uh, how did that give you a chip on your shoulder and a toughness that you've carried with you throughout your career? Well, I think the biggest challenge, and, and I credit my parents for doing this, is they always had me play age levels up mm. uh, to, to never make it easy. You, you develop every other skill. Um, you see in just a basketball reference, you see kids now that are so ball dominant because they're playing with their own age groups and they're always – the best player on their team Um, and then as I transitioned and got older um, from playing up so much I knew how to cut I knew how to screen I was a scrappy player I had to defend so I think in that competitive environment and in playing up at grade levels not only in in an organized environment but also in like the pickup games we had in our backyard we had you know older cousins guys five six seven years older you you learn a lot not only to to find your way in a competitive standpoint but also do the little things and, and not just in basketball but in every sport. So, Frankie, tell me a little bit about what you believe uh, and how you would define in your own words what a peak performance or experience is and, and what are some ways that you get into your own peak performance. Yeah, I think peak performance can go in, in two different directions, I think mentally and physically. Um, I think physically peak performance has to do with your preparation and, and how you work out. Um, and, and it also ties into your mental you know, peak performance. But I think just starting with the physical, you know, how you take care of your body, what you put in your body, um, it, it has a lot to do with how you play in terms of weightlifting, you know, what type of lifts are you doing, um, what type of pre and post, you know, stretching recovery. I think as I've gotten older and, uh, you know, became and gotten to different levels, you realize that recovery is honestly the most important thing. Yeah. So I, th- I think your preparation physically um, it is huge in terms of peak performance. Um, like, I, like as I transitioned through college, I, you know, walked in at 5'11", 155 pounds, and I left, you know, six foot and a half, which helped me grow. Um, but also, you know, weight-wise, I was 185 pounds. I was strong and could hold my own, and you're, you become more durable. So I think that, you know, ties into peak performance. And then your mental state, I think it helps as well. If, you're, if you know that you've put in the work, you know, in the weight room, on the court, you, you really have this this peak confidence because you know that you have something to rely on. If you have a bad game, you know you know you've put the work in and uh, percentage wise or or what your value is that you're going to come back and have a better game. Um, and I think you know your mental preparation is big too. You know how you view the game. Um, peak performance can have to do with you know a scouting report, who you're going against. If if you could pick up a couple tendencies or a couple of plays that you're you're you know going against your opponent, that could be also peak performance. And it's a mental side. It has nothing to do with physical ability. Um, it just has to do with your preparation. So, yeah, man, you, I, you had quite the journey at USF. I remember your freshman year, you weren't playing very much. I was redshirting. We played at your guys' place, and, and you hit me up after the game. Hey, let's let's get a run in. And I, I yeah. just think that passion that you had for the game always. I always knew you were going to bounce back and find a way to to be successful at that level. But I mean, just just in your own words, man, talk about the transition of of starting at USF. You know, your hometown team, then leaving, and then coming back and and, and maybe not getting the minutes that you wanted right off the bat, but then becoming a two-time all-conference first team. I mean, that journey, a lot of people don't don't see all of that, the ups and downs, but take me through just that experience and, and if you can give just backstory on that on that journey. Yeah, yeah. for the listeners that don't know, I wasn't heavily recruited out of high school. Um, I had two scholarship offers, Idaho State and USF. And I ended my recruitment a little bit early because I was a big USF fan growing up and we were season ticket holders and I was a ball boy. So number one, I wanted to stay close to home and, a good Jesuit education was important to me. So I ended that um, real quick. And then uh, going into my freshman year at USF, I had high expectations. Um, things didn't work out. They had another freshman point guard that they kind of turned the reins over. And at the end of the year, I kind of saw the silver lining. I think I averaged, you know, eight minutes a game and one point. So, you know, nothing eye-opening. 
and I call it kind of saw the silver lining and sat down and uh, the other point guard that they had was a really good player and uh, he was you know sort of a ball dominant point guard similar to I am and uh, I you know I said to myself I can't sit here for three years and I wanted to to play and, and try to reach my full potential so I sort of bet on myself I decided to go to a junior college close to home Kenyatta College in Redwood City um, <clears throat> was with them all summer going into my sophomore year and in the fall and was planning on playing um, and we had the number two shooting guard, JUCO shooting guard in the country on the teams, which is why I chose to go there. I knew there would be, we'd have a really good team and there would be a ton of coach in the gym looking at him and looking at me as well. Um, unfortunately, he tore his ACL on his official visit to Oregon mm-hmm. in the fall. This was like two weeks before the season. And once he went down, I, you know, sat down with my family and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to have to redshirt as well. It was just uh, too much to risk to play um, in terms of junior college because you have to have a really good team, but you also have to put up good numbers to get recruited. Um, So I sat out my whole sophomore year. It was a redshirt year. I wasn't with the team. I was literally waking up every morning. I'd go to the gym with my dad. We'd work out. I'd go to class. I'd come back. I'd lift weights, and we'd go to the gym again every night. We did that six nights a week. And I would say it saved my basketball career, honestly. Um, looking back on it, um, in the in the moment, I was really, really just focused on getting better, transforming my body. I really wasn't concerned on where I was ending up next, which is unique because it could be worrisome in that situation. Um, but you know, I, I completely changed my body, completely changed my game, became more athletic, and also just became more appreciative of the opportunity, like mm-hmm. being at Division One. You know, the perks that you get, someone's paying for your education, the free food, and all that. Um, so it was an eye-opening experience. Um, make a long story kind of short. In the spring, I still didn't know who, where I was going to go. I was looking to either go to like a smaller mid-major, big sky, big west schools were kind of talking to me, or I was going to do another junior college year at Pima Community College in Arizona. We had a, a mutual friend that was coaching there, and he said, hey, come on over, and, and I think I can turn your recruitment around. So those were the couple options I had, but uh, Kyle Smith got hired at USF, and uh, he had recruited me a little bit at Columbia, so we had a relationship, and the day he got hired, I think a week later, he called me and said, hey, I want to offer you a scholarship to come back. Immediately, I said yes, you know, having the hometown ties and, you know, USF being a place that I love. Um, came back as a redshirt sophomore. Um, we went on a foreign tour. I played well. Um, and then during the preseason, struggled a little bit in terms of practicing. Um, broke my hand like two days before mm. the first game. Um, so another kind of high and low there um, but but kind of always you know as I go throughout the story my, I always had this goal um, of playing professionally no matter what happened so like like you touched on my freshman year the nights where I didn't play I would always get in extra workouts like you said we you know we came back to Burlingham after playing in a game and we had four Eastern Washington guys and three USF guys playing pickup which is yeah. like unique stories um, but anyways broke my hand before uh, the day before the first game missed eight games um, sophomore year was, was up and down. I had, you know, a really good tournament in the Diamond Head Classic, you know, started the first couple games of the league. Then uh, kind of my minutes fell off, um, was, you know, running the scout team at one point my sophomore year. Um, so highs and lows, dealt with it. Um, that, that spring was like, all right, I'm going to keep pushing, trying to get better. Um, going into my junior season, kind of same attitude, you know, ramped up the workload. Um, and also the recovery, and, and also kept working on my body, working on my body. Beginning of junior year, there was a freshman that started the first six games. Um, and at that point, it was, you know, really, really tough for me. You know, you know, sometimes you see the, see the silver lining, and you're thinking, wow, like, this might be my last two years of basketball. You know, not a lot of guys become professionals if they're, you know, back up for four years. Anyways, um, I could tell you a story. I was driving to intercession class in December of or January of my junior year. And I, uh, I was driving to class and kind of had this aha moment. I called my dad. It was like 7.30 in the morning. I, not many people know this story, but it's a great one. I called him at 7.30 in the morning. I said, hey, dad, you know, I know you're sleeping. Left him a voicemail. It was like two minutes. Hey, I know you're sleeping. Just wanted to let you know, like – I've worked my whole life, you know, for the moment, and I feel like I've failed so far. Um, I feel like I'm overthinking things, putting too much pressure on myself. From this point on, you know, my mindset's changing. I'm, I don't care what anyone else thinks. Um, I've had this goal of being a professional my whole life, so if anyone's in my way, I'm going to run them over. So mm-hmm. that sort of thing. A couple F words in there, um, but I won't, I won't share them on here. Um, but in a nice way, that's basically what I said. I said I've been working my whole life for this. Um, it's go time. Like, 
I'm desperate. I was desperate. It was a moment of desperation. Um, became the starting point guard the second game of conference. Kind of went on a tear. Was first team all conference that junior year and uh, opened up eyes. You know, helped my name nationally. Um, and then going into my senior year, that it was a real breakthrough. Like every, when every, when I broke through finally that junior year, the game became easy, and I just felt like I was playing basketball again, like back in high school. And then my senior year, obviously, you, you said at 15 and six, and we were an NCAA tournament team um, going into the PYU game. That was a big win for us that we talked about, and we were we were uh, last four in, and then we unfortunately dropped our last couple games and, and had a few upsets but all in all I think that that breakthrough call and that transition in my mindset kind of of desperation you know you put your all eggs in one basket and, and my goal was to become a professional basketball player and at that point I thought I was failing and something needed to change and uh, I made the change and the rest is history. I, I, one thing that really stands out to me in that was just your ability to stay dedicated to the craft regardless of what was happening externally and then that just that final push, bro, that confidence that you embody just to, to make it happen. So tell me about, I mean, obviously the expectations that you said you wanted to get rid of, you know, caring about what anyone else thought about you um, as you were, you know, really striving to be a starting point guard. But once you became a first team all conference player, people are talking about you around the nation. How were you still able to hold off those those expectations because I know going in your senior year there was a lot of talk about your guys' team. How did how did you maintain that confidence without letting it get to your head? Yeah, I think just growing up, like it, it all it all goes back to, you know, where I grew up. Guys always said, Hey, you know, he's probably a division two player in high school. And then you go to USF and you fail and they're like, well maybe he should, you know, go to a D two, D three. Nothing against that level. Mm -hmm. But for me, I had different goals and aspirations and believed in myself. And so they're like, hey, you know, maybe, I, you know, people said, hey, maybe try baseball again. Um, and so that was, you know, negatives that I had to deal with. Um, and then going back to USF, he's, you know, the backup point guard. And again, maybe this shouldn't, you know, maybe he made the wrong decision. A lot of bark and question, especially being a hometown kid, there's some pressure there. Um, and then when I broke through, um, for me, it was like no turning back. I didn't look at it as pressure or expectation um, because I believed in myself and I held myself to the highest standard. So for anyone else to hold me to any higher standard would be impossible. Um, I wanted to be a professional. I, you know, I still want to play in the NBA. Um, I'm going to take a different route, but um, I'm still going to try to play at the highest level and, and there's going to be doubters there. So there was no um, kind of deal with this expectation or whatever you want to call it because I had higher and higher exp uh, aspirations that people even knew about. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So now we'll dive kind of more into optimal experience and your performances. I, I know I said it earlier, but you had one game against BYU where you just were unconscious, missed three shots, had 23 points. Would you say that's the game you felt like you were most in your zone in your, in your peak performance? And, and what really got you into that moment? Yeah, as I look back at that, I think, you know, to touch on that game and then also I think over my college career, at least the last two years, I had my best games against the best teams. Yeah. Um, that goes back to like holding yourself to the highest standard, but also opportunity. Like, you know, professional scouts, whether it be in Europe or the NBA, are going to be watching the games against Gonzaga, BYU, St. Mary's, just because they have those high level players. And I think as I look back, those were my best games. So I think that, in a sense, was a different preparation going into those games and the expectation. But to, to, to go back on that BYU game, it was a point in our season where we were tied for second in the conference on the bubble for the NCAA tournament. And kind of relates back to that desperation I had in my junior year where like my goal in college basketball was to play in the NCAA tournament. Everybody wants to. And it was on the road in Provo in a tough environment, 20,000 people. Um, and so I, you know, basically said to myself, you know, you have to do whatever you can to win this game or else you're going to be, you know, an NIT team or what have you. Um, and we were down eight points with 12 to go. And I had a good first half, um, was rolling, knocking down shots. But really that, that final eight minute stretch was pretty unbelievable and it was almost a moment of desperation where like you, you know again you've worked your whole life to you've watched the NCAA tournament every basketball player that plays in college wants to play in that and it was like if I lose this game it's over so I kind of you know ended up taking the game over and uh you know thankfully we made some shots and they missed some and uh it was uh it was a good thing for the for the program unfortunately we lost the last four games but in that moment I think just from a mental aspect for those listeners um, it was really like a desperation, do or die all out, and you just find a way to survive. I feel like the, one of the reasons why your, your, your best games came in the biggest moments and against the toughest teams were 
I feel like you've always sought out the best competition outside of, you know, game settings. You want to play against the best, so you can become the best. And yeah. I can remember I was a freshman in high school going into my sophomore year, and we had a good relationship with City College of San Francisco, and my dad helped run a gym in Burling games, so we would be in there, you know, every night. But um, that summer, going into my sophomore year of high school, we had, you know, open gyms and, and different guys in there. We had guys that are in the NBA now, DeLon Wright, and, and uh, he was at City, as well as like the eight or nine Division One guys they had. And I was a freshman in high school at the time, you know, you know, trying to compete with those guys and, and doing the little things. So I think seeking out the competition, if you want to beat the best, you got to beat the best. There's no running away from it. Um, like if my journey to the NBA, you know, you gotta, you, you can't be afraid of, you know, having a guard, Russell Westbrook, Chris Paul, and yeah. and Mike Conley. Like when I was with the Jazz in summer league, Donovan Mitchell. Like you see those guys working out, you know, before you guys start summer league practice, and a lot of guys are like, whoa, it's you know Donovan Mitchell. But in reality, you know, if you can't move past that mentally and look at it like, hey, he's a basketball player, I'm a basketball player, we we both have the same goals, then then you're in trouble. So there's one play specifically that I, I want to ask you about. There's this popcorn play that kind of went viral. Yeah. Um, I mean, it just always seems like you have a great time out there. You're always dialed in, and, and you love the challenge, you love the game. Um, you know, I just don't think the, the popcorn play really happens without you just enjoying the moment and, and really embracing it. So take me through that play and what was going through your head. Yeah, so uh, fell out of bounds off uh, kind of through a, a hammer pass baseline, and, and we had a guy make a three, and I fell into the stands, um, and my hand happened to, to land in some popcorn in the first row, and we were up by 20 at the time at Cal, and I, and I really didn't think to do it as a, as a thing of disrespect. It was just literally like my hand fell in the popcorn, and I was like, hey, might as well grab some and threw it <laughs> in my mouth. Um, and, it, and it got caught like right as I turned around the court, the camera guy was right in my face, and uh, right after the game, my phone was blowing up. The, the thing kind of <laughs> viral. So, back to your point, like enjoying the moment. I tell people in certain circumstances like that, but just also in the game, like I'm always smiling and laughing because two years before that, like I was sitting on my couch. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't have a team to play on. I, I didn't have a school to play at. So like I was real appreciative of even just playing the game of basketball at the level on TV, what have you. So I think you always have to enjoy it. And I think some people that don't, you know, go through dark times kind of don't see that sense. But uh, I think, you know, your lowest time is going to make you the person you are. And, and, and for me, I was just really appreciative to be playing. Yeah, that's huge, man. Um... So then, obviously, after your season, after a great season, uh, you do some pre-draft workouts. Take me through that, and then also the summer league the opportunity. Yeah, so uh, right when the season ended, I had a couple weeks at home, and then um, I did a, a pre-draft kind of, uh, I guess you'd call it training, in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That was where my agent was. Uh, that's where he lives, and he has his trainers out there. So I was out there for eight, eight or so weeks um, with a roommate, Garrison Matthews, who played at Lipscomb. Big time player ended up signing with the uh, Wizards this year, but uh, eight weeks there, um, high level training. You know, you're living in an apartment, you're working out three times a day. There's no distractions. Um, you're just trying to get in the best shape of your life. And then to touch on the pre-draft workouts, I did six of them. Um, I was flying all over the country. I think I had five in or four in five days. I think I went from Sacramento to Golden State to Myrtle for a day to Orlando back to Salt Lake City. Um, so that was one of the craziest weeks of my life, not only uh, physically, but mentally, just time change, sleep, and, and the pressure going into it. But uh, very enjoyable. Um, like I said, for a kid that was sitting on his couch his sophomore year of college, not knowing what he's going to do, but also to have the belief and, and the sense that, you know, this has always been your goal. And, and when you're walking into the, you know, the Warriors workout and Steve Kerr knows your first name and says, hey, I was watching you all year, you're kind of like in awe. Um, yes. But it, it was a cool experience to, to really meet new people. Not only you know the GMs and the coaches and the trainers, but also the players you were in the pre-draft workouts with because they really are good guys. Um, and then uh, as the draft happened, um, we were knew that I would you know sign as a free agent somewhere. Uh, we didn't know in what sense of a contract, but uh, the first goal, like I said, was summer league, and and uh, we were fortunate enough that Utah gave me the chance, and, and I flew out there and went through training camp and played eight games in uh, Utah and uh, Las Vegas. I thought, you know, I could have played better. There was an adjustment period, but all in all, I thought I did well. I just didn't shoot the ball well enough, um, but passing and defense was there, and uh, I was satisfied with those fronts, and it was just overall a good experience. You know, we really had a, a good group of guys, like no egos, or everyone was really sharing the ball and rooting for each other, and, and in the NBA, it's a business. Like, they'll tell you, hey, you're going to sit out the whole game tonight, or you're going to play every two out of three, and you just kind of have to deal with it. And, 
in the short minutes that you're going to get, you know, you may only play 10 or 12 minutes, you know, two minutes of bands, you got to try to make an impact. Um, and, and that's something I learned and that's something that has really helped me. It's awesome, man. And so I guess over the course of my career, I got pretty big into meditating and finding different ways to mentally prepare for games and, and ground myself before them. Do you have any, any tactics like that, that really get you into that, into that zone or that self-confidence that you have in yourself? Or is it really just ball rolls out there? You're, it's go time. Yeah, um, nothing, nothing too tricky. Um, at night, you know, I do do some meditation just through listening to music, mm. but nothing very structural meditation. Just kind of, I'm a big country music fan, so that's how I get my headspace. I'll throw some headphones on. That's how I kind of fall asleep every night. So I consider that sort of meditation. But even before games, like I would never listen to music. You see a lot of guys, you know, get all pumped up and and you know put their music on or bobbing their head and whatnot. And there's nothing against that, but that just didn't work for me. I was always try to stay even keel and uh, just kind of treat every game like a game, you know, yeah. don't get too high, don't get too low. It's basketball. You know, you just got to try to go make shots and, and not let the other team make shots to, to keep it simple. But um, I guess you could call this meditation. I did have like a pregame, you know, dribbling, shooting, warm up that I do. I'd get on, the, I'd always be the first one on the court, no matter if it was home or away games. And it was a good 25 minutes. I'd be soaking wet um, with sweat. It was almost like a, a workout before the game. And I think that, you know, preparation even on a game day when you're getting extra shots and extra work builds your confidence and also gets you into that zone that you talk about um so that's something that you know people might not consider like a mental meditation but for me it, it was yeah, there's been a lot of talk about uh injuries and injury prevention especially for the youth just overtraining and overplaying um one question uh that you brought up that we should discuss is is how do you get away how do you get away from the game uh, either mentally physically emotionally and step away just so you can be fresh and go and, and attack it when, you, when you're back on the court. Yeah, I'll kind of answer this in a couple ways. I think not only burnout physically, but burnouts mentally, that, that those even could be worse. And for me to get away, um, you know, I like to golf. I've, I've picked that up recently. Um, I bought an Xbox this year just because of Fortnite, just because I had so much free time. So that could be another thing I, I do enjoy. I'm a big country music fan, so I'll go to any concert that's around. And then also just spending time with family, you know, and not talking about basketball, but talk about life or pick up a TV show that you guys could watch together, whether it's, you know, with your family, with your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and I think for me, I struggled with taking time off, um, even growing up and throughout college and high school, because the more pounding you do on your body when it's not necessary, the more likely you are to be injured. And, um, I think as I grew up and got older, um, older, not in a good way, but when, when your knees start hurting after practices, you kind of realize, you know, what the, you know, what you're going into. And I think like for me to, to, to give kind of a story, I had just finished summer league, um, June, July 15th. And I took a week and a half off of basketball. I didn't touch a single basketball, you know, did yoga every morning. Um, taking that time off was, was super beneficial for me as hard as it was because there's so much free time in a day and you feel like you want to, you know, keep getting better. I think it's vital, you know, a test, another a test to would be the, you know, two weeks after the college season, I didn't touch basketball. And, you know, earlier in my career, you know, you can say you're less mature or whatnot, but as you grow older and you realize like those weeks off, whether it's five days, whether it's 15 days, I know some pros, you know, in the NBA don't touch a ball for a month. And I think it's important because you could also, you know, re find your love for the game and also, you know, um, pick up other things, you know, learn how to golf, you know, let your, let your mind, you know, get off of this competitive state that it's in and kind of just enjoy the smaller things in life. Yeah, man. Um, so I guess moving forward as a basketball player and just as a person, what what impact do you really hope to make uh, on and off the court? Uh, just embodying this kind of underdog role that you, you came up through a lot of adversity. Um, you know, what, what what impact do you hope to leave? I guess just for people that look up to you. Yeah, I think just just playing at the highest level for me, goal wise, um, whether that's a Euroleague or whether that's the NBA. But more importantly, you know, being a good person and developing relationships. I think as I've grown up, I've realized that developing relationships is really the key thing to life. And uh, you know, being a good person on and off the floor. You know, on the floor you could be as competitive as you want, but treating people right is important. And I think lastly, just giving kids, you know, at our size, hope that you can play basketball because. Mm -hmm. There's not too many, you know, six foot white dudes running around that are getting paid a lot of money to play. Um, and so, like, I had heroes like Steve Nash and John Stockton and, and you know, 
Scott Skiles. People might not even know who that is, but those are one of my dad's like favorite players. And so I was watching tapes of these, these shorter guys and guys that I knew that I was going to have to play like, and hopefully I could be that for, for the next generation of kids um, moving forward. But I think more importantly, just being a good role model, being a good person and, and having a work ethic and embodying who I am. And I think if you could, you know, help one kid out there, like yeah. it, it could be something. So that's beautiful, man. And, and so do you have one challenge, I guess, for the listeners and viewers? It could be athletically, uh, mentally, whatever. Something that you, you felt like really helped you as you were growing up and developing um, as a human being and as an athlete. Uh, if you have one challenge that you, you would like to pose for people that are listening. A challenge? That's a tough question. Yeah, you can take your time. Take your time. I, do say. I think more importantly, and this is something that I actually learned in one of my master's classes at USF last summer, is a professor really preaches run your own race and, and not focus on you know what everyone else is doing. And I know you can attest to it because I, I was the same way like in high school when everyone's getting these offers and recruitment and you compare yourself to a lot of other people. And, and that's something that you, it's hard not to do, but it's, it's part of the deal. So I think just running your own race. And I'm in a situation now where – guys you played against or with in college or signing NBA contracts and you're not and um, it is what it is you just kind of kind of run your own race and move on and just keep getting better yeah that's awesome man I really appreciate you joining me man uh, it was great to just get to know you a little bit more um, and I look forward to following you as you just keep, keep rising on this journey of course anytime we'll have to uh, do one next year and see where uh, where I'm headed oh next. yeah oh yeah for sure thank you guys for tuning in if you enjoyed the podcast please share with your friends to spread the word you can follow me on Instagram at Flow Station Podcast and find all the interviews on iTunes, Spotify, and the video version on YouTube. Thanks again and keep flowing.